Okay, good morning, everyone. We are at the top of the hour, so I would just like to take a second to welcome everyone to our fourth session of Girls Make IT Better. Thank you for joining us this morning. Today, we have some special guests from the Cleveland Great Lakes Science Center who will be leading us through today's activity and telling us, telling us a bit about their career paths. So I'd like you to give a warm welcome to Ter Karen Targo, who is the STEM Learning Product Manager at the Great Lakes Science Center, and Jen Avedon who is the guest engagement specialist at the Great Lakes Science Center. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jen and Karen and let them get started with telling us a bit about their career path and then leading us through today's activity. If you have any questions at any moment of today's um, session, please put those in the chat box and we will go ahead and um, field those to our speakers. But thank you for joining us. We're very excited. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Great Lakes Science Center. Thank you for the introduction. I am Karen, and I am the STEM Learning Product Manager here at the Science Center. So really quick overview of what I do is I manage all of our products, which are technically our STEM learning programs, our educational programs. And I get to make sure that we are delivering the right products to the right people. So I need to make sure that we are delivering what people want and what people need and that also they know about it, that they know what we're what we have to offer them. And um, then I go back and I make sure that we're continually delivering the right product. So through evaluation techniques, through talking uh, to the folks that we are uh, delivering our programs to and making sure that if we need to tweak things to make them better, that we're constantly doing that. So we always have the best programs out there and a really brief intro about how I got into this position. I have been working here for about six years and I was not in a STEM or a science field prior to this. I was in a lot of educational positions. I mainly worked um, in formal schools for over 10, 12 years in school offices and in back offices, um, running the offices and running programs. And then I also worked a bit in informal education through after school programs and enrichment programs as well. So when I, I'm originally from Cleveland and I was gone for uh, many years. And when I moved back here with my family, I still wanted a job with an education and started looking at informal education just because I thought that would be a lot of fun. And the job was here at the Science Center. And the one reason why I was drawn to the position at the time was because it called for somebody who knew how to work with schools. And my experience in schools prior was really helpful um, in getting that position. So while this wasn't a position in a STEM career that I was initially looking for, because of that education tie-in, I definitely was interested in this position and was, was very happy to get it. And so even though I wasn't looking for a STEM career, I ended up in one and I've been here now for six years because I love it so much. And I have grown myself personally within learning about STEM and how to use STEM in your daily lives, like problem solving and problem identification and just perseverance and persistence. And all of those things that we teach in STEM, I have grown to utilize in my own life and now love teaching and sharing out about those as well. So we're very happy to bring you this programming today. And I do just want to remind you all out there, especially our teachers and students, that we are still open and running virtual education programs. And if you would like any more information, please visit our website at www.greatscience.com. And because they're virtual, we can provide those to anybody in the area. And our programs start off as low as $50 per program for your classroom. Um, and those are our virtual tours. We can actually go deep inside one of our exhibit areas and show off just like you were here in a field trip. So it's our virtual field trips. We do virtual science shows as well for your classes. And then also what's really cool is we do virtual hands-on workshops. And in order for it to be hands-on, we will deliver kits to your school that are individually wrapped that you can hand out to your students. And those are a lot of fun. We've had a lot of great success at that. So thank you for joining us. And I am happy to be here with all of you today. And now I'd like to introduce Jen Avendet. So 
Hello, everybody. Um, touching on what Karen was talking about, I am one of the actual STEM educators. So she hooks us up with the teachers and schools and programs, and I present those. So uh, the way I got here was my entire life, I have been interested in science. I took all science classes in high school, got my bachelor's in science and biology, got my master's in science and biology, and then I went to work um, in academia at Case Western Reserve. I taught bio there and ran a research lab for about 12 years. So that was great. I, we actually had a bunch of high school students and then younger undergrad students that I was able to mentor and provide advice and insight on how to be successful in the field. Um, but then I had my children and realized the lack of um, science education within the schools. So I wanted to look to reach younger kids. So I ended up leaving CASE and coming to the Science Center because it provided me, I could still use my science background and knowledge, but also wanted to get touch uh, base with the younger kids. Um, I definitely do a lot with middle school and high schoolers, try to show them the different STEM programming. We do a lot of engineering workshops, technology workshops as well. So that's what I do here. So I'm gonna be leading you guys today through our information. There's a couple of activities within. Um, you just need a pencil and paper for them. Um, but otherwise, I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen and we will get started. Okay, so here we are. Girls make IT better. So we are going to touch on three different subjects today. Thankfully, the gender gap is slowly disappearing. Um, I know even when I started, uh, what was that, about 30 years ago, it, I, there were a lot of classes where I was one of the very few females in there. So I know that's becoming more and more uh, closer to 50-50. I know engineering is still a little bit male dominated, but we are making progress. So we wanted to touch a little bit uh, here on blockchain technology, data bias, and encryption. So first of all, what is data? It is just the digital information that can be translated or processed between devices. So I know you all probably think of data on your phone, but that goes to somewhere and comes from somewhere. Um, and that is a network. So the network is the connected group of devices. So you can see here, we have the three little computers connected in a triangle. So here you see one computer in the network. It's allowing data to come to the next computer the next computer, they have to be connected to the network though. And each of those little computers or electronic devices are called nodes. And the way the data is transferred, there are two different types of network. There are centralized networks and decentralized networks. So here you can see on the left, the centralized network, you can see there's a network in the center here in between all of those nodes. It kind of fans out like a flower. They all have to go back to the center before they can deliver information to another node or another device. Over here, we have a decentralized network. You can see that our nodes are all spread out and information can just go from one node to the other, or one device to the other. There is no centralized server. So some pros um, over here is really easy to monitor as in a centralized network. It's easy to monitor the data and the information because um, it's all in one area, right? The problem with that is it's also easy to hack into just one central server. So that's the downside of the centralized network. It's also a little bit slow because you have to go from one node back to the server and then go to the other node. You can't just go directly. So the opposite is true in the decentralized network. You can just go pretty quickly from one node to the next 
makes it much more difficult to hack, so your data is more secure, but it's also more difficult to monitor. So I don't know if any of you have heard of blockchain before. I know it's a pretty new topic, um, but maybe you've heard of Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. Basically, it's just virtual money and it uses a decentralized network, um, like we talked about, where you can just go from one node to the next, one person to the other, no centralized network. So over here, you see Sue and Bob. So Sue gives Bob 10 Bitcoin, okay? This information is then added to a block. So this is just what we call it. This Sue gives Bob 10 Bitcoin is just the first block of information. And the good thing is everybody can see it. It's a record and everyone can see it, okay? Within the block, there are two unique identifiers. There's a previous hash and a set of numbers. And then there is a hash number with a set of numbers. And this is gonna be important for the activity that you're going to do. So there's a previous hash and a hash. If you can think of it like a fingerprint where one block only has one previous hash and one hash number, that's unique. Then once the one block is full of data, then we have to create another block and then another block. And you can see they link together in a chain. So that's where the terminology comes from for block chain just a chain of information linked together that everyone can see. So here's another example of that. You can see here, the previous hash is the number on top and the beginning first block always, always, always has a previous hash of zero, zero, zero. We call that the genesis block because that is where the chain begins. Then it has a random group of numbers here on the bottom and that's its hash number. In order to pair the next block of information with it, we have to look at the previous hash and make sure that it matches with the hash number. So because one, two, three matches with one, two, three, we know that those can now go together and make a chain. Now we go to the next new hash number that's generated for that block and it is DB7. So now we have to look for another block that has a previous hash of DB7, and that pairs with that. So four, five, six is that block's number. So if we have a new block here, ABC, in order for them to link up, this would have to be a previous hash of four, five, six to pair just like the other blocks did in the chain. So now this would be ABC for its new hash and then the next block would have to be ABC until it ends, okay? So that is an example of a blockchain. It is linking together act interactions that happen. And as long as they pair up, as long as their fingerprints, their identifiers match, then we can form a chain from that information. So a real life here, we got Sue and Bob again. Sue gave Bob 10 Bitcoin in the transaction. Now, because everybody can see it, that is a way to make it very secure, okay? So those people here are called data miners. They make sure that the Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency or virtual money, they make sure that it is not duplicated because that's a way that you can make counterfeit money virtual counterfeit money, okay? So they have to go through and check to make sure that that's not duplicated. If it is, they will not verify it and that will not be able to link to the chain. So that'll have to be thrown out. As long as it's legit, it's good, it's not duplicated, they say, okay, it's all good. It can be linked to the chain. So again, it just makes it much more secure uh, to have all these data, data miners checking it. And then right here, it gives it a timestamp and says, okay, Sue gave Bob 10 Bitcoin. We looked at it, we verified it, it's good to go. It can now be added to the chain, the blockchain.
So now it's going to be your turn to do an activity. We have a blockchain game here. So you're just going to use a pencil and paper and you're going to do what I showed you how to do in the previous slides. This is your first block, your Genesis block. And we know that because the hash, the previous hash is 000, right? So that's the beginning of it. So now we're going to need to make all of these blocks verified and chained together. So what you need to do is go ahead and see the previous hash is the top number. The hash is the bottom. You're going to need to fill in the blocks here to make these all link together. Okay, so remember the previous hash of one block has to match to the hash of the next block. So go ahead and take a few minutes and fill in the empty spots and then we will go over them. Okay, I don't see any questions, so hopefully that means you're following along. We'll go ahead and fill in the blanks together here. So like I said, we start with the previous hash, 000. We have the hash 1AB. So in order for that to link to this block, we would have to have 1AB in the top here for the previous hash, 1AB. So it would link together like this. The next one is completed for us. So we move over here. We need to link this block with this block here. So because this is D94, we know it would have to link over here with the hash D94 in the fourth block here. So that would be D94. Now we move over here. Again, we have a blank spot here, but we know it has to link with the previous hash of this block. So 002 has to link over here with the hash 002. And then finally, we have a blank spot here. We know that it would have to link with this block, so it would have to be K03 for the hash here. So they would link up there. And then we would have a complete blockchain with eight blocks in it. So good job. I hope you followed the blockchain. Um, we're gonna move on now to our second topic and it is data bias. And I have to say working in uh, biology my entire career, there is a lot of data bias that goes on. So this is something very important that you will probably use in the future in all aspects of life. Um, it's just basically facts and stats, statistics collected together for reference or analysis. So, I mean, you can pretty much collect data on anything. You could say like, what kinds of boxes of cereal do you buy in a month? Or how many times do you look in your phone in a day? A anything you do, any type of behavior, any movement, anything you can record. Um, and that would be data. It's just information. So data on its own is not really significant. You have to collect a large amount of data to analyze it on a larger scale. If you just say, you know, how many times did you look at your phone today? That doesn't really tell you a whole lot. You have to see how many times you look at it tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day, and then kind of analyze your data based off of several days. Um, and then you might be able to make better predictions and understand why you make those decisions. Like, why did you look at your phone a lot that day? Or why did you buy that many boxes of cereal or that, or that kind of cereal? And that information, using that to predict a future outcome is called predictive analysis. So as humans, we're all different. We have our own preferences, our own opinions on things, our own thoughts. So we naturally have biases. Even though we really try not to, everybody is biased in some way or another. So that subtly influences how we make our decisions and why we make them. Uh, the definition of bias is prejudice in favor for or against one thing, person, or group compared with another usually in a way that's considered to be unfair. So we are going to play a game to see if you have data bias. We're gonna look at 25 monsters on the next slide. So again, you're gonna need your pencil and paper. You're gonna have 45 seconds and you're just gonna choose five
five monsters that you would choose to be your friend or that just look appealing to you in some way. Okay, so I'm going to flip it to the slide. You're going to have 45 seconds to write down. Um, they're all numbered, so just write down the numbers of the monster. And when the 45 seconds is up, we will move on to the next slide and go over it. So here are your monsters. I'm going to start the timer and uh, go ahead and just pick five monsters that you would want to be friends with. Okay, so you have your five monsters that you wrote the number down. I'm going to go back to this previous slide, but I want what I want you to look at is your five monsters to see if there's anything similar between them. Look at the color of your monster. Look at its mouth. I know the mouths are tiny, but see if you can see um, any similarities in the mouths that you picked, the skin texture, and the size of the eyes. So that's what we're going to look at. Um, and kind of make a note to see maybe what's similar in your five monsters. So you can see some are furry, some are scaly, some are slimy, they kind of have drips of slime off of them. Um, the eyeballs are different sizes. The mouths, some of the mouths are open, some are frowning and some are smiling. I know it's kind of hard to see the little line but you can definitely see if the mouths are open. And then obviously you can tell if it's blue or green. Okay, so what you guys were doing right there was analyzing your data. Okay, so these were the five that I picked for my friend. You can see uh, two out of five were furry and four out of five had big eyes and three out of five have their mouths open, like a big smile. So I can use predictive analysis now to say, okay, if I were gonna pick a sixth monster to be my friend, I would probably pick one that had big eyes and its mouth open and looks like a smooth, scaly type skin here. Not slimy, not furry, but I had three out of five that were scaly. So that's using the data that you have and then using that to predict what your next monster would be. So now we're going to compare the green monsters or blue if you have blue, that's fine. But in my example, they're green and compare them to the yellow monsters. Okay. So like we said, I have four with big eyes three that have a scaly type skin and three that have their mouths open. So based on those five at the top, which of the bottom monsters do you think I would pick? So again, we're doing predictive analysis, taking the data that we have and then predicting which one you would choose on the bottom here. So I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but number one is smiling and it has big eyes. So even though it's furry, I did have two furry out of five. So I would say number one would be the most likely monster that I would pick out of those four based off of the characteristics I chose in the green monsters previously. And again, I'm showing you how I do four out of five, five out of five, zero out of five, just makes it a good way to summarize your data and keep track of it. So just take a minute here and think back to the monsters that you chose and why you may have chosen them. Like maybe did you choose ones with large smiles because they made the monster look friendly and you like friendly people? Maybe you stayed away from monsters with frowns because you thought they were unfriendly. Uh, regarding the eyes, did the large eyes make the monsters appear to be cuter to you or did the smaller eyes make them appear to be cuter? Maybe did you like, you know, the furry animals better because it reminded you of a stuffed animal or um, there are many different ways that you have your own biases. So some of the monsters may seem like they didn't follow a pattern at all. So maybe you picked five that were like all completely different. Um, that's fine too. You may have had four monsters that had large eyes and one with small eyes. 
So four out of five had large eyes. When it's that much of a dominant trait, when you look at how many out of your choices are the same, if you just have one that's different, we call that an outlier. So that happens a lot with data sometimes, and even with larger amounts of data. You may have 100 of something, but one of them doesn't make any sense at all. So you can um, go ahead and call that an outlier, and then you don't use that in your data, in your analysis. Okay, so again, we deal with data bias all the time. You will definitely deal with it in your life and in future classes. Another thing you deal with, our third topic today is called encryption. And I know you all uh, using encryption. It's been around for centuries. Uh, back in the day, they used to use it during times of war when the enemy started to intercept sensitive messages between the troops. So they started making a code for them. They would encrypt it and then only give the one army the key to decrypt it. That way, even if the enemies got a hold of it, it wouldn't make any sense to them. They wouldn't know. They didn't have the key, so they didn't know how to crack the code. We also use them um, in cybersecurity, which we've been talking about a lot today. It's a way to keep information out of the hands of anyone that the information is not intended for. So I'm sure all of you have a phone and you probably have. Uh, password for it. Um, again, if somebody doesn't know the password or how to get into your phone, then it keeps your data and your information secure in there. As we talked about before, blockchain is very successful due to encryption. You gather the data for it, encrypt it, and then store it in the blockchain, which ensures the safety of the information. So this is just one example of a way to encrypt something. As long as you have a code, you can make any type of encryption. You can make it out of symbols, letters, numbers, anything. As long as you have a key to decode the encryption. So here, this is one code called binary code. Um, I'm guessing you've probably heard of it before. It's a series of zeros and ones. And the binary code that we're using today is a series of just five zeros and ones. It can go up to higher sequences. Um, it just depends on what you're using it for. Obviously, the more numbers, the more digits that it has, the more secure it would be. Uh, but for today's purposes, you can see the letter A is just a series of four zeros and a one at the end. So again, if we have the code here, it, the key, it's very easy to decrypt the code. Without it, you would have no idea what those zeros and ones meant. So we're gonna do another challenge for you guys here. We're gonna have you use the key right at the bottom here and decrypt this message written in binary code. So again, each letter is five numbers. So you can see this is four letters here. So you need to find out what 00111 is in the key below and so on. So you'll end up with four letters that make a word. So go ahead and do that. Okay, so you may have um, figured out what the four letters are and you're like, what does that? That doesn't make a word. What is she talking about? Guess what? It's GLSC and it stands for Great Lake Science Center, which is where we are. So hopefully you were able to decode that. The last thing I wanted to talk about was really the whole point of us bringing this to you is because there are so many career paths that you can take in the field here using the information that we presented and of course more information that we didn't have time to present. You can become a computer programmer. You can do data science, and that's, I mean, I analyzed data for years um, as a biologist at case, so that's basically any type of science. You collect any data, you, you need to be able to analyze it. There's network security. You always need to keep your network safe. There's software engineering, web development, information systems, and a mobile application developer. And these are just a few. There are so many different career paths you guys could take. And uh, hopefully we will get some more females on the STEM career paths and maybe we will dominate it. So thank you all very much.
Um, we're going to turn it back over to you guys. Thank you. Let's give a big round of applause to our presenters today. Thank you, Karen and Jen, for presenting today's activity. Um, I learned a lot personally, things that I did not know before. So we are going to move on to our second activity of the day, which is a, um, we are going to do our Kahoot quiz where we'll have the opportunity to ask our presenters a few questions, as well as test our knowledge of what we learned today. So I'm gonna go ahead and get that started here. Okay, so our first questions are questions to ask the presenter, which are, what do you enjoy most about your job? What advice would you give to someone interested in entering this field? What was your major in college? And how did you choose a career in STEM? Let's go ahead and lock in your answers. Okay, so our winning question is, what advice would you give to someone interested in entering this field? So I'm gonna turn it over to our presenters and if you guys feel comfortable asking that, answering that question. Yeah, I got it. All right, so I, um, my advice to everyone going into the STEM field is to take a variety of classes, get any experience that you can. Um, a lot of STEM learning is hands-on. Um, I know most kids and adults actually learn better by doing things. So taking any labs you can take, learning how to code robots, I mean, any introductory class, I would highly encourage you to take. You never know what you might fall in love with once you start doing it. Um, yeah, that's really what I would do is just take a variety and then once you find something you like, continue on that path. The good thing is you can always change your mind. That's what I always tell people too. They get so nervous when picking a major for college. Try something and if you end up not liking it, it's okay. There's a lot of other subjects to choose, so. Okay, thank you. Jen, uh, or I can't see the screen, but do our, does our other presenter, Jen or Karen, whoever didn't answer, wanna <laughs> give their advice? <laughs> yeah, this is Karen now. Um, I agree with Jen in just getting out there and trying something new try, or trying something that you may even think you have an interest in and don't even wait until college. You can do it now. There are so many programs out there available like the one you're in right now and I appreciate that you're in this one. But find those other programs, find other ways that you can get that experience because that experience is so important to have even before you're going into college or another uh, type of higher education. So um, look around, see what's out there and take advantage of everything that's out there. Thank you so much. And I, we're gonna ask our, sec our runner up question as well. So the next question I have for our presenters is, how did you choose a, uh, choose a career in the field of STEM? Sure, and I, I touched on this briefly. This is Karen again. I touched on this briefly before when I introduced myself, but I. I don't wanna say that I chose to be in STEM, but I did when I started working here at the Science Center. And it was a little intimidating at first because I didn't have a background in STEM, but the more I learned about what STEM was and all of the great facets that it you can use in your life in any part of your life, I fell in love with STEM. And now I'm passionate about teaching STEM and I chose to stay in this career because of it. Um, and just because of, all of the ways that STEM can help benefit your life um, in general. Okay, and this is Jen. Yeah, hi. Um, so I would say too, I like STEM. I was always good at math and science in school, but it wasn't until I put them together that it really made sense to me. The math wasn't just learning math. It was using math in order to collect and analyze the um, science aspects that I was interested in. And then I also learned how to code uh, when I was in college as well, because I could analyze and summarize my data a lot faster if I could write a code to do that for me. So for me, it was all about making them go together and apply them so that it wasn't just learning something for the sake of learning. I know my kids always say, why do I have to know this? Why do I have to learn this? And it turns out when you actually find something you love, you do apply it. And it's actually beneficial to learn it. So that's my, that's my advice. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you both. Okay, 
So Jimmy is in the lead with David right behind him. Okay, our next question is again, is gonna be another question for our presenters. So our options are, what has been your experience as a woman in the field of STEM? Did you always want to work in this field? What piece of advice would you give to yourself while in high school? Would you choose the same career if you had to do it all over again? So lock in your choice. Okay, so it looks like our winning question is, would you choose the same career if you had to do it all over again? Um, and this is Karen, I'll start first. Absolutely, yes. Like I said before, I wasn't, I wasn't ever intentionally trying to get into STEM, but when I did, now everything that I've learned and utilized in my life, like I said before, persistence, problem solving, perseverance, I have found myself it, it now affecting the other parts of my life as well, not just my work life here. And I have grown personally just by, by being in a, a STEM career. And I have found that just so amazingly um, important in, in continuing what I want to do in my life. And because I'm finding a career that helps you grow as an individual, um, it can be rare. And it's also something that I enjoy. So. Yes, absolutely, I would do it over again. And this is Jen. Um, so I would I would also, I can't tell you, um, you know, I can't wait till we can actually have students come back in the building again. There is just nothing better than, especially when you have middle school students who come in and they seem like maybe they're not interested in being there. They, they, they think they're not good at science or they, don't, you know, just don't want to do it. And within an hour, they leave, they are confident, they did something successful, and like I helped them do that. And that is just the best feeling in the world. So maybe they will go back now and have a bigger interest in science, or at least some, you know, some confidence in themselves. So yes, I absolutely love what I do, and I would do it over again, for sure. Wonderful, thank you. And then I'm going to also throw out our runner-up question, which is, what has been your experience as a woman in the field of STEM? This is Karen again, and I um, I want to say that currently in this day and age, in the modern day and age of being a woman in the STEM field, I think it's empowering. And I'm going to say that because there are so many options um, and opportunities for women today in the STEM field, and it's great because we also want to reach out to each other and help each other succeed in this field as well, which I do find very empowering. Back to what Jen had said before, you know, when I was growing up, women were not, girls, females were not encouraged to go into STEM. You know, we used to take these, you know, what is your job opportunity quizzes, you know, when I was in middle school and it was things like real estate and advertising and art um, and things like that were what I got because I was a female. So I think it is extremely important to, for young people today to realize that there are so many opportunities out there, and also that there are many people that are willing to help you get there. And sometimes you just have to reach out and ask, and that's why I think it's so important um, and empowering being a woman right now in STEM is being able to help uh, young females as yourselves and those that enter our building or now do virtual programming every single day and being able to inspire them and show them what they can possibly do with their lives. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Thank you for running our activity and telling us a bit about your career experience and asking and answering our student questions today. We're now going to move into our next questions, which are going to be testing some of the knowledge on the activity we participated in. So we are going to go on to our next question, which is which of the following is not true about centralized and decentralized networks? So which of the following is not true? Decentralized network data does not need does not pass directly to its destination centralized networks data goes through central points then its destination decentralized networks data passes directly to the destination centralized networks a single point can be a failure a risk okay so our answer is decentralized networks data does not pass directly to its destination okay very good our next question goes. Why is it important to use a combination of numbers, symbols, and letter when creating a password? 
So our op answer options are down below. The question is, why is it important to use a combination of numbers, symbols, and letters when creating a password? So lock in your answers. To protect private information. Very good. Okay, and our final question is, which below applies to the predictive and analytics? So the question is, which of the below applies to predictive analytics? So our, our answer options are down below. Lock in your answer. Okay, very good. Looks like everyone, it looks like most majority of the class got the answer correct. Very good. Okay, so let's see who made it on the podium. In third, we have M. In second place, we have David. And in first place, we have Jimmy. Very good. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for participating. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Come back to the meeting. Thank you, everyone, for participating in today's activity. And I'd like to give our presenters one final thank you for leading today's activity. You all did fantastic. Um, I do want to let you know that our next session of Girls Make IT Better will be on January 7th, 2021, which sounds weird to say. <laughs> and as always, it'll be at 11 a.m. Teachers, we are going to be sending out a thank you email after or immediately following this meeting. It is going to have a survey in it. We're at that midway point in Girls Make IT Better, so we'd like to get your feedback on today's session and previous sessions. So keep your eyes open for that. But thank you all for joining us. Thank you for participating. It's been great. And have a wonderful day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.